Adjusting to America, that's hard. That's hard. Could you imagine if you don't speak the language and then you go to another country and you have to live there, you have, you have no skills, you have no language, you have nothing, right? You know, no education. Uh, so that, that is not us, not much for us because at least we learned French. We had education background and, you know, the knowledge is transferable. You can learn another language quicker if you know already one language. But for most Cambodians who came here, Remember, most of the educated people one were killed by the communists. So the one who were able to get out of the country were people in the countryside in the remote area. Never been to school before. Did not even know how to read or write Cambodian language. Forget about English. So when they came here, they have a hard time. For me, I went back to car I went to community college to learn my English called the ESL program, English as a second language. It uh, took me a long time, you know, to learn the language. So it took me six years to finish college. Then after that, I went to uh, Pittsburgh University, then got a degree in engineering. Again, you know, I never want to be an engineer, but my brother said that you must go to engineering school, you know. <laughs> and here, uh, well, because of jobs and so on, you know, we didn't think too much. For six years, I didn't have a vacation. I didn't have any time. Oh, I had to work day and night, you know, weekend and so on because we came with not even a single penny. Uh, another misconception of the American people here, when we came, they all thought that American government, the government gave us housing, cars, money, everything. But actually, they, we, get, we get a few hundred dollars a month just to pay for the uh, rent and the utility bills and food. That's about it. You know? And actually, people have to work so hard you know, to support their family. And you can ask every Cambodian family would be the same thing. They didn't know that we have to work day and night, sometimes two or three jobs to support the family, right? And spending, never go to see a movie, never go to a restaurant, never go anywhere, right? No vacation whatsoever, you know? Eat as little as possible, but eat as much as possible, but as cheap as possible, and to save the money for children to go to school. For me, I wanted to go back to school, you know, that's my lifelong dream, then I went back to school, at least I got a degree in engineering from Pitt, but I, my family, as you see, you know, we all teachers, so I came back to Philadelphia, there was a position open with the school district, then I took that position, and then became, went to Drexel, so got my master's degree in, in education, and then I became a teacher. And I, it was not that bad for me to adjust to the new culture, because we learned so much about Western culture and so on in Cambodia, but for most Cambodians, yes, they have a lot of problems, and they are still struggling right now, yeah. all the time, yeah. even now, you know, <laughs> even now at the present time, I've been teaching in the school district for so many years. I think there's uh, a lot of misunderstanding and misconceptions. Number one, when, when I go anywhere, people look at us and then right away they thought that we are Chinese. Right? You know, I make sure that my students know that I'm not Chinese, I'm Cambodian. And we are a lot different from the Chinese. Culture, language, everything, you name it, you know? <laughs> yeah, that they have to understand that. So part of my job also, I, I was doing professional developments for teachers and staff to let them know about differences between Asian culture and American cultures and also between each Asian culture because they have, they have to work with these kids at, in the classroom. They have to better, they better know their culture you know, to serve them well. And I heard one time a teacher asked a Cambodian student to help a Vietnamese student because she thought that we speak the same language. And the student didn't do that. The teacher thought that she was so rude. The student, I say, no, no, she was not rude. She couldn't say, you know, they don't understand each other. You have to understand that. Sometimes because of the healing techniques, you heard about coining, cupping, right, or pinching. When we got sick of fever, we use coin to scrape our skin, and then you can see the dark red on the skin. And the principal saw that, the counselor, the teacher saw that, they thought, oh, this is child abuse. So they called the human resources, you know, police come to take the children away from the family. That that's, that's incident happened almost every year. So I was going around and teach them how to know, you know, probably you should contact community leader. Uh, we, have com we have community or family doctors, right, consult with them before you take anybody away, you know, from the family. 
that's not right. Yeah, you have to learn about the culture. There are so many things that we can learn. So mis- most importantly, I think the misconception and misunderstanding and the discrimination between the groups. Just yesterday alone, I got a call from a teacher from a school that I used to work, I used to help. That the, she didn't mention Cambodian, but she said the Asian will get beat up so much in the lunchroom. And then when they retaliated at the subway station, the police arrested the Asian kids. Yeah, think about that, you know. But most of the time, the Asian were the victims. I met Cambodian parents who went to school who got beat up by the students in middle school, right? Yeah, she just went to visit her school, you know. I walked at the school one time on the sidewalk. There was an egg throwing from the window from a classroom, you know. So they saw me, they called me Jackie Chan, you know, <laughs> Mr. Miyagi, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. <laughs> there are so many names that they call you, yeah. Yeah, this is still going on. Well, there's so many things to learn. To me, uh, number one, to uh, the, the most important thing that I keep saying over and over again, you know, sound like I'm like uh, the preaching of Obama, you know. <laughs> hope, yeah, never lose your hope. That's number one in ever in in any condition, because I found that at that time, you know, with the Camaros, I learned about history. At that time, the world history, you never saw any country who became a communist who could turn back into a democratic or into a free country again. Never, it never happened, right? So when Cambodia was occupied by the Camaros. I know that we were in big tunnel, you know, a dark tunnel that never have. You didn't see any light in front of you. But I met some friends, and then we only hope that someday. My life at that particular time, tell you, telling you the truth, was that I was hoping I could escape, right? Always, every single moment, I was thinking about escaping. But at the same time, I did not want to hurt my family, right? If I escape alone, that is fine. So. After 1978, when they evacuated my family away, right, I was alone. I was on that direction to Thailand already, actually, you know. But I was lucky enough that I was not killed. I was arrested, like I told you, right, a couple of times, actually. But uh, they were suspicious that I was running away from the country, but I didn't go like that, you know, I moved slowly. So I was thinking about escaping, but the hope of surviving or finding freedom is, is, is nothing important than that. Yeah, that's one. And the other thing is about, uh, as a Buddhist, we always emphasize about uh, tolerance, forgiveness, right? So now we uh, we have a lot, uh, we have some problem with the people who were there when they were placed as leader in the communists in the Khmer Rouge time. And now, you know, it was over. So people kill each other after the war is like crazy also. And as a Buddhist, we have to look back and say that if the people understand and admit it, they did something wrong, you know, we have to forgive about that. We have to tolerate. Otherwise, the killing will never stop. It will go on and on forever. I couldn't go back right away since I came in 1980 until 19 years later. By the way, in 1993, uh, the UN, the United Nations, went by to Cambodia and asked people to vote to have an election. Whoever they want to elect, they will bring that person back. And, you know, not surprising, people elected the king to come back. Right? CNU came back as a king. And then the country changed back to the kingdom of Cambodia or Cambodia right now. But the uh, prime minister was the problem with the issue that the uh, King Sihanouk's son was supposed to be the prime minister then, but the uh, current prime minister at that particular moment adopted. Well, what I want to say is that uh, now I uh, belong to uh, a group we call the Buddhist, the, Kham- the Khmer Buddhist Humanitarian Organization in South Philadelphia. And uh, we want to, uh, now we settle down, we have a job, you know, so my daughter went to college and uh, I have time and then I can do something by it. That's the only uh, happiness that I find, you know, in my life that I can share my experience so that people understand it and hopefully that we are not repeat it again. And we help spe- particularly the Cambodian community in this country right now, right in front of us. You know, they have so much problems that nobody are going to, they, they abandon like they've been ignored for so long. So if 
I am a member of the community. If I don't start doing something about that, you know, who are going to do that, right? So actually, Cambodia, it was not a really a class system like in India or somewhere else, right? Even though my family maybe have a better uh, in terms of uh, material, in terms of education and so on, but I was born in still in a small town. So I, I grew up with all of these farmers and peasants and I, 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 that's my heart, you know. If I go back to Cambodia, I never want to live in the city or going back to live in the old, you know, rich style. No, I want to go to live in the village in the uh, somewhere, you know, that I can help the poor people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's no problem whatsoever, actually, you know. Even though they, see, the other thing for me, I, from time to time, I have to ask a lot of questions about myself because during the Khmer Rouge, even now sometimes people look at me even the Cambodian people, I'm talking about Cambodian people, they said I'm not Cambodian, I'm Chinese because I have light skin. Yeah, that bothers me sometimes because to me, you know, I was born in Cambodia. Uh, the other culture, C- C- Cambodian culture is this. Cambodian uh, culture is probably one of the few uh, in the area which is called matriarchal, you know, society. We go with our mother side. So even though my father is half Chinese, but my mother is Cambodian, all the children will say they are Cambodian. That will not happen in any way all around that area. In Vietnam, if the father is, Viet- uh, is Chinese, the mother Vietnamese, all the children will say they are Chinese. Also in Thailand, right? And you heard about, you know, probably know about China. After the wedding, the girls must go to live with the groom's family and serve them for the rest of her life. Not in Cambodia. Yeah, the opposite. The girl must go to live with the girl's family and serve, you know, the rest of his life to the girl's family. So the wedding, everything will tell you that Cambodia is very strong on the mother's side. So to me, yes, but I don't know that I would stay and live there for forever because I, I still feel that uh, my daughter is a one problem, right? That she was born here, she was growing up here. That's up to her. But she know, you know, she likes you know, Cambodia. She likes to go around and helping people just like me, which is great. You know, we can do that together. But I still have a lot of relatives here, my brother, my cousin, my uh, you know, nephew and nieces. And also, I feel this way. I feel that if anybody who can help Cambodia, the fundraising that I want to do in the future when I'm retired, where all can you get the fundraising better than here, you know? So I had to come back here and do that and then bring it to Cambodia and have them there. So maybe come back and forth, you know, between the two countries. Now both of them become my home country. And I'll also I have to say I have to be very thankful to the American people and this country who gave me a second chance, you know, this is my second life, you know. 